Hi. Uh, welcome back to my commute. Uh, this time we take a little bit more of a scenic route, but you're not going to be seeing any of it. You're going to see me, and that's fine. But bear with me on my commute, because I did see something fun and interesting on my commute today, which was on somebody's lawn they had their old stove. A black stove. And the old black stove had a big sign on it that just said, free. Now, I want you to think long and hard about the um, quality of that stove. As in, probably not great. You can probably determine just by looking at that stove and the fact that it has a big sign that it's free on it that's not worth your time to go pick it up. Even, even if you're looking for a stove, I don't know if I'd recommend it because you're probably just getting an enormous amount of headaches, you really are. I would think, anyway. There's a chance, there's a very slim chance, very unlikely chance, that what you're getting is something amazing, right? That it's a fantastic stove that somebody just didn't have room for or they inherited it from a very wealthy relative. It's top of the line and they just were so emotionally attached to their old stove they had to put this one out on the yard, say, free. But even then, they'd probably sell it if it was worth anything, you have to assume. The fact that it's out there in the yard with a sign that says free makes you think that maybe it's not worth your while to go look too deeply into it, right? Well, yeah. And anything that you're trying to um, uh, have somebody else take you up on, it doesn't do you a lot of help to really, really undervalue it. It doesn't do much for you to have the thing that you are trying to get to somebody else wildly undervalued and like this is a, a technique that you've got to explain to anybody who's asking anybody else out on a date is if you start your uh, date process your date asking process by saying listen you probably hate me and you won't want to go to a movie with me but in case you would how about you go to a movie like that doesn't work it is wildly ineffective to start your let's go on a date process by saying you would hate a date with me do you want to go out? I'm sure you'll say no. Yes, at that point, the individual that you are trying to date is probably going to say no. There's a, there's a, five will get you 10 that they're gonna say no thanks to you at that point, and why wouldn't they? What you've done is you've set them up by saying to them, here's a product that you're not going to want, and it has no value. Would you like to take me up on it? And most reasonable people will say no. Now, that works for stoves in your yard, it works for dates that you're trying to go on, and it also works for uh, inviting people to the church, for theology. Most of us have a way of presenting the church and things around it as though it is something to be avoided. Like, we bring it up to people who are like, hey, yeah, you're probably not going to want to come to church, but in case you ever did, you know, consider mine. Um, and the way we frame it is as though, like, we're being punished and we want you to be punished too, right? Like, you know, yeah, you, you kind of should go to a church because we've all got to suffer a little bit, that kind of thing. And when you sell it to people like that, it's extremely unlikely to, uh, to take off or to be part of what they're going to want to do. Are they going to sit there and say, wow, like you told me I was going to hate this? You told me this is going to be awful? You told me this was going to be the worst thing that I was ever going to have to deal with? Can't wait! See you at 11! I mean, that's not really how it works. But that's the way that we sell a lot of things. And honest to goodness, the more important something is, the more we're likely to sell it in like kind of a ramshackle backwards way. So if it's like a very small thing, like a like a pencil or a blender or whatever. You can be totally effusive. You can say, oh my gosh, I love this blender. Or man, these number two pencils are the best. If you get yourself a stand mixer or like a Vitamix blender or something like that, you can say, yeah, this changed my life. I love it. I am all about this. This is who I am now. Well, yeah, sure. But the more important something is, the less well we sell it, you know? Um, because like, the most important thing that you're, you're selling, really, which is yourself, and not like you know, actually selling yourself, but the most important thing that you're selling is you to a prospective mate, and you spend like a generous amount of time trying to talk them out of it. And sure enough, 
when we're selling something as important as, as God and the church, we tend to sell it in the same way. Well, you probably wouldn't like this, but in case you would, here you go. Now, if you can be faithful with small things, you can be faithful with big things. Ask yourself why it is that you see the movies that you see and the TV shows that you see and you buy the things that you do. Because odds are, fair to amazing, these aren't all your decisions, like made from your heart, uh, just you in a vacuum, right? There's a good chance that the majority of these decisions that you make, you make because somebody else said, you know, I really like this thing, maybe you want to give it a shot. Now, you don't always like the thing. There's a good chance that they'll tell you to watch some TV show or whatever, and they'll be all about it, all day, every day, and you don't necessarily care for it, which is fine. But if somebody's like really effusive about something, if they really like it, if they're, if they're saying, I love my Instant Pot, I can't get enough of my Instant Pot, it's amazing. I make ribs, I make chickpeas, I make lentils. You can tell I have an Instant Pot, by the way, because I do make these things in it. And I am a bit of an Instant Pot evangelist on, where I, it is something that I use all the time. If somebody asks me, hey, what do you think of your Instant Pot? I'm happy to tell them. And I'm also happy to tell them about the effects that it's had on me, right? That's why it's useful for me. If somebody says to me, what, what do you even do with an Instant Pot? And I can tell them, well, with an Instant Pot, you can take lentils or chickpeas or, or garbanzo beans, which are the same thing, or uh, pinto beans or anything else like that. You can take all these things and you can make them from dry to edible in like 40 minutes as opposed to having to soak them overnight and, and, and boil them for hours. They're just ready in 45 minutes. It's great, it's a complete difference, very big game changer. But the way I'm gonna talk about it is part of my own personal experience. And the reason I'm gonna talk about it that way is because it has been good for me. I like it, it works for me. And granted, it's not gonna work for everybody. I've had people say, well, I don't like the Instant Pot. Fine, you don't have to, but that doesn't change why I would recommend that, because I'm not necessarily recommending it for you in your situation. I'm telling you what it was like for me. And I can be faithful with that kind of stuff. It's a small thing, very easy, it's an instant pot, they're very popular, that kind of thing. But a lot of these decisions that we make on what to buy, buying an instant pot, most people who buy an instant pot do so on the recommendations of other people, whether they know those other people or not. It might be a complete stranger on the internet. Think about um, how you decide what to buy on Amazon. You go onto Amazon to go look for like a doorknob or, or, or a knife or whatever, and there's like thousands of them. I mean, how are you supposed to know which of these is any good? Amazon doesn't just have one knife. They have thousands of different choices for your kitchen knife. So how do you know which one to get? Well, if you do what everybody does, you go into the list of knives and you look up the best rated one. And you get that. And that's about it. That, that's your thought process. Or if somebody you know in real life has told you, I loved my following item, it's really great, and you go for it, that kind of thing. We don't have time in our lives to buy and try out every single knife that there is got time for one. That's about it. So we're going to make that decision based on the decisions of the people that have come before us. That's how that works. And if it's somebody that we know and somebody that we trust and they've had a good experience with whatever the item is, that may affect things for us, truly. It may say that we are more likely to make that decision based on that information, which is important, right? Like that's, that's, a, that's how we make decisions and how we come to and church is no different. Church is the exact same. If somebody's asking you about like your church that you participate in, there's a very good chance that your own individual testimony about the congregation where you're worshiping and about your life in it is going to be vitally important for them to make some kind of decision. Most people, there's really two main ways that people start coming to church. Number one is if somebody they know recommends it to them, 
and number two is they happen to be born into it. Otherwise, like, yeah, there's a chance that somebody might just wander off the street and say, church, never heard of it, let's go check it out. Good thing I'm here on a Sunday morning at 8.30 in the morning. Maybe, but more often than not, they're gonna have somebody they know, somebody they trust to say, you should think about this thing that's important to me. In the same way that you'd recommend a brand of apples, or a brand of sneakers, or a stand mixer, or a blender, or an active fry, air fry, or any of these things, you'd recommend those in the same way. It's pretty great stuff once you understand that it all works in the same way. And what people are looking for is guidance from people they trust, right? Like that is worth all the weight in the world. Part of your job as an emissary of Jesus Christ is to be that person that says, okay, so, and like, there's a good chance you don't have to preach or teach like Peter or Paul or, or plumb the mysteries of the universe. The average person is probably not looking for that. The average person is looking for community in divinity, right? Like, they may get to the point where they want to talk about the age of the earth or, or practical theology or any of these things. They may get to that point, but odds are fair to amazing. What they're going to be looking for first and foremost is going to be community in divinity. That's that's really basically it. And everything else will proceed from there. If you're able to offer them that, or able to talk about how that has been in your own life, you're going to be miles ahead in the evangelistic conversation. And most people psych themselves out of making hard choices or hard sells. Most people psych themselves out by saying, well, you know, I, yeah, the, again, the, the bigger the stakes, the more we're going to talk ourselves out of it. And especially with evangelism, because nobody feels cut out for it. Nobody feels that I mean, what people do. I mean, you know, obviously, you've got your Eric Fiesels, who was all about evangelism. Yeah, fine. But most people don't really look forward to that. Most people aren't saying to themselves, boy, I sure can't wait to get out there and evangelize. People are terrified, and they're terrified about getting it over their heads, um, and about not being able to explain exactly how God works, what He's all about, how Holy Communion works, what baptism is, how how the um, communion of the saints functions, uh, about the, uh, the nature of the Trinity, that kind of thing. But guess what? When you're trying to talk to somebody about your stand mixer or your Instant Pot, you're probably not going to all the effort to try and explain how these appliances actually work, like what the technology is that causes them to function. Like you don't, like you probably don't even know. How would you know that? You know that it, uh, you close the lid and when you open the lid back up again, the, the ribs got cooked. Great, good. But you talk about the effect it has on you, and nobody can do that better than you. You are the best person equipped to do that on planet Earth, because only you know how the Holy Spirit works in your own life. Only you know the effect that worship services and attendance has on you. Only you know what it is like to be at the altar rail in your shoes, receiving the body and blood of Christ for the forgiveness of your sins. Only you know that, which puts you at the uniquely poised position to be able to have that conversation with people. So yeah, in many ways, if you psych yourself out on the evangelism question because you think to yourself, well, yeah, but it's too hard, or I'm not really up to it, or this is really not my thing, sure, fine, but you know what is your thing? Telling people good news about things you like and things you enjoy. That you can do. That we can all do. We're all cut out for that. And in that particular situation, nobody's better cut out for that than you. All right. Thanks for joining me on my commute, everybody. We'll see you on the next time.